I absolutely hate this weather. I hate it. I feel like every day I come in here, it's the same thing over and over and over. They made a movie about that, didn't they? Well, I'm not really sure I'm carrying that much rage around, but we do have some weather elsewhere to look at around the continent. There's the surface analysis. We've got a receding high there off the east coast. That's bringing a deep southwesterly flow into much of the Midwest and central U.S. You can see temperatures are coming up pretty sharply there at Erie, Cleveland, Columbus, all in the 60s, but New York still stuck in the ice box with upper 30s. And in between, there's that warm front heading west to east. Up to the north, we've got a new Canadian system. That's sort of an Alberta clipper, but the central low is mostly heading towards Ontario and Quebec. However, that will still bring in a supply of dry air into the northern U.S. and probably drop the temperatures down in the northern states. With a push of 10, 26 millibar pressure, that's probably not going to make it very far south. In the Yukon and Alaska, temperatures are falling into the minus 20 to minus 30 range. However, the pressure is not really that high at the surface, and I would not expect a whole lot of depth to that cold air. Yeah, there's the Fairbanks sounding from about eight hours ago. Not much depth on that cold air, topping out about seven, 8,000 feet. In fact, the layer of air below minus 10 Celsius is measured probably in the 100 to 200 foot range of depth. So this does not really have the potential to bring much cold air south into the U.S. Now, considering the very bitter cold air is very close to the surface, then you have this moderately cool air up to 7,000 feet and then mild air above. How do you take that into account? How do you average this out? Well, we've been talking about it the past few weeks. Thickness. Thickness will tend to average the temperature profile. The 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness will average everything in this layer right here. If we look at a breakout of the data from University of Wyoming, we see that they've got a thickness of 526 decameters. 526 is not an excessively low thickness. We would find it right about there on that Canadian map and then somewhere in here on the Alaska map. It does look like there are colder readings, 516, so that might clue us in to look at some of the other soundings. Here's Whitehorse Yukon, 20 Celsius, that's below zero Fahrenheit, and that does have considerable depth. That extends up to about six or 7,000 feet, very cold, and that tops out probably about there, and maybe another top right around there. So this is getting into some beefier cold air, and that explains why the thicknesses are lower in that region. I know this thickness chart is a mess. That's the problem with using these continental scale graphics, but are we going to carry any of that cold air southward through the weekend into next week? Well, some of it moves south. I can see 504s and 510s coming into Manitoba right there. And if you look at the isobars, you can see northerly flow. So this has the potential to come south. And there it goes, but it only lands in the Great Lakes area around Monday. And you can see the plains already getting into southerly flow. So this is not a particularly conducive pattern for cold air to come southward. I can see a 962 millibar low out there in the Gulf of Alaska. That's pretty powerful there. That's probably bringing in some warm air advection, maybe a small atmospheric river, maybe some moisture from the Pacific. That may lay down some fresh snow cover there. And we can see that generates a little bit more polar air towards next Friday. And that does come south. You can see the 540 line pushing all the way down to Memphis and Tulsa behind this cold front right here. So I think there's potential for it to get much colder towards the last few days of November. 
and then the downslope pattern returns. More of the same clear skies. In fact, look at how this forms up synergistically, this very, very deep southerly flow coming all the way up into the Arctic. That's on December 2nd, but that's kind of transitory. They get into that stormy pattern again, and after that we shall see. But this is interesting. It's breaking out some convection in Texas around December 5th, which is not too unusual. We do get episodes of severe weather during the winter in Texas. That does happen. And some of you may remember the Rowlett tornado a few years ago, a couple days after Christmas. Okay, for our installment of Dynamics 109, we're going to talk about a special kind of flow pattern. Take a look at these winds out here in the western U.S. You can see there's northerly flow in Alberta, southerly flow in Washington and Oregon, and it kind of spreads out somewhat like that. Here's a closer look at that using the SPC graphics. And there's the streamlines superimposed. And that gives us a pattern known as the deformation zone. And we most definitely see deformation zones on a day-to-day -day basis. The specific system off the coast of California will show a pattern somewhat like that. We have stretching along that axis and contraction along this axis. Here's kind of a simplified diagram of the concepts we're talking about. You can see the axis of contraction right there. The wind is spreading apart from that axis of contraction. Likewise, the axis of dilatation. The wind is heading into that axis, producing some convergence and bringing mass together along that axis. Now, if you have both, obviously they cancel each other out. Now here's a good question. What happens if you have a thermal gradient? Say we have cold air over here, warm air on the left side, and we superimpose that deformation zone on top of it. How will the temperature gradient react to that? Well, obviously this side is going to be carrying in warm air. This side will be carrying in cold air and these will not really be doing anything at all. So what will happen, what will happen is something like that. We pack that temperature gradient even closer together. We amplify the thermal contrasts and we get phonogenesis. Remember, phonogenesis is an intensification of the thermal gradient. So now we'll take that thermal gradient and rotate it. So it looks something like that. So we put that same deformation zone on top of it. What will happen to this? Well, we can see this part of the flow is carrying milder temperatures outward and removing the warm air. And this side is carrying away the very cold air and replacing it with milder temperatures. This side and this side are not really doing anything. So the end result of that will be a weakening of the thermal gradient. And that gives us frontolysis, which tends to break fronts apart. Don't worry about the edges. I couldn't get the palette to work right. But focus on this area and you can see that we have removed the thermal gradient. So how the thermal gradient superimposes on the deformation zone, that tends to control what your fronts are going to do. So let's head back to the SPC graphics. What does that mean for our deformation zone right here? Well, we're going to need to see a plot of temperature, of density, of thickness, or something. Well, this is handy. In here, they've got a deformation and axes of dilatation choice. Remember, the axis of dilatation is where you have stretching. It's like taking a rubber band and pulling it apart. And that's what's happening here. And what we see here is that the thermal gradient is parallel to 
that axis of dilatation. Hmm, what did we say here earlier? Okay, we've obviously got phonogenesis in that area. And if you don't have that handy axis of dilatation, you can pull up a streamline plot. Well, they don't give us streamlines, but another way of doing it, well, there's the thermal gradient, and there's the wind plot, and you've got pretty much everything you need to figure that out. And obviously that's the axis of dilatation, and since it's parallel, you've got phronogenesis right there. Well, hopefully you've learned a little something interesting today. Got a nice note from Ron Chalfant yesterday. He says, hi, Tim. Thank you for taking your time to produce these videos. I appreciate your expertise. He mentions that fire weather has a big impact since he's in a mountainous location. And he spends a lot of time in the summer and fall studying the weather patterns over California. So I'll be back to you soon on that, Ron. Many of you will see Ron there in the comments. And that reminds me, if you do enjoy these weather casts, please comment, like, and subscribe. Okay, and that'll wrap it up for today. Hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. And please remember to spread the word. Let people on social media know about Forecast Lab. All right, take care. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.